All right, this is Dr. Apsimo of osteoporosis. So I'm going to um, talk about the definition, the risk factors, the etiology, pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, investigations, management and outcomes of osteoporosis in that order. All right, let's go with definition D. Um, it's a pretty easy definition from who and the one that everyone uses is bone mineral densis, density mineral density um, greater than 2.5 standard deviations below the mean peak age mean I mean peak bone mass yeah so they're really simple Yep, you know what standard deviations are. Um, Alright, risk factors. Um, I'm going to do them in a bit of what might seem like a weird order, but it'll make sense. So, um, dark skin, um, poor sun exposure. Um, right now, these risk factors, I'm not really doing them, like some are bigger than others, so. I'm not doing it in any particular order on which are more important than others. Um, diet low in vitamin 12, I mean vitamin D. Uh, liver, liver disease. That's one lot. Um, another lot's age. Well, age. Age is probably probably the biggest. Um, Biggest risk factor, um, and another one has been a woman. Uh, men get it as well, but they get it a bit later. Um, sedentary lifestyle. Low body weight. Yep. Um, oh, this is getting messy already. Um, low, cal low calcium intake. Um, corticosteroids. Um, I'm gonna write low vitamin D again. It'll make sense in a little while. Um, and then uh, and then some other miscellaneous ones are smoking, um, hyperthyroidism. Gastro issues, so um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, heparin, renal failure, and other rheumatology disorders, so like rheumatoid arthritis. All right. Um, so these are sort of some miscellaneous ones here. Um, having low testosterone, like being a male with low testosterone is also a risk factor. Alright, so they're the risk factors. Let's look at some, let's look at the etiology of the disease now. And I'm going to basically try and explain why these things are risk factors and how they fit, fit in with it all. So I'm going to start with... Um, I'm going to start with this stuff in purple here. Yep. Alright, these are all causes of low vitamin D. Um, so let's think about how vitamin D sort of works. Um, it's surprisingly complicated. Sun, I'm just going to draw, draw out this thing here. So, sunlight, skin. Alright. So the. Um, 
the, the precursor to vitamin D, the most important precursor, is um, 7-dehydrocholesterol, yeah. um, and there's also D3. So D3 you, you can get from your diet, but it's actually not that important. Um, a lot of people, I think, make it out to be more important, but the, the big important thing is the big important basic source. Oh, sorry. D3 is the important thing. You can get it from your diet, or you can it can be converted in your skin thanks to sunlight, the UV rays, into from um, 7 dehydrocholesterol um, and D3 is uh, how do you pronounce it? Caliceltriiferol. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not so good at pronouncing things. Anyways, so important stuff. You get it from this, from the skin. It in itself, doesn't do anything, but it gets converted in the liver, so here's my liver. It gets converted into the liver into 25-OH-D3. And then that gets converted into the kidneys. Kidney, yeah, that doesn't look like a kidney. Yeah, it kind of looks like a kidney. It gets converted in the kidneys but, um, to its active form, which is 1250H2D3. Yep. Whew. All right, so that's why risk factor. So what's this matter? Well, who gives a sh who who gives a damn? Um, this active form of vitamin D does a few important things. Firstly, it in increases um, calcium gut absorption. It um, increases bone calcification. And in a kind of complicated way, it kind of increases the movement of calcium from sites of absorption to sites of deposition. Um, so it's a little bit, a little bit complicated how it all works. Um, probably through osteocytes. So that's how vitamin D is important. Now, I'll move on to age now. Um, age is probably the is biggest predictor, I would say. Um, lots of reasons. Um, it's kind of complicated, but things like decreased growth hormones, um, reduced um, protein anabolic, anabolic function, um, increases your risk of having a, other risk factors like being um, sedentary, not doing much. Um, you know, also, older people tend not to get as much um, vitamin D, and they tend to have other comorbidities like liver disease and all this stuff over here. So, you know, it's a big one. Now, women is in two ways. Firstly, women have a lower peak bone mass in the first place than men. So, I'm going to come down here now, and in big red I'm going to write peak bone mass, and I'm going to put that in a box. 
and here I'm going to write increase osteo class slash their activity and here I'm going to do osteo class decrease arrow here, arrow here, arrow here equals osteoporosis so this is kind of the basic basic mechanism of how it all happens you, if you don't start off with that much bone mass or uh, you can actually just be one of these I guess but um, generally a combination of low peak bone mass so you don't start off with as much bone I guess and you have too much osteoclast activity so they're the ones that absorb bone and so if you have too much of that and too little osteoblast activity and they're the ones that build up the bone so let's go back to women um, women do not have as much peak bone mass as men um, testosterone tends to um, increase bone mass it could be other things like they don't work out as much and that kind of thing, but it is hormonal. Um, the main reason is testosterone is, I guess, better at um, increasing bone mass than estrogen in a way. Um, but estrogen is still very important, which is why we're now going to talk about what happens when age and womanhood interacts. So, being older and being a woman brings with it menopause. Now menopause is so you have your decrease in estrogen um, and estrogen normally causes a decrease in osteoclast so it actually kills off it actually um, promotes osteoclast um, apoptosis so by removing estrogen or having less estrogen you're going to have more osteoclast there's going to be a lot of arrows here <laughs> um, the other thing that estrogen also does is it also um, causes an increase in growth factors um, and these have an effect of um, osteo on the osteoprogenitor cells so it kind of like stem cells but more limited to stuff to do with bones it normally estrogen increases growth factors that actually makes more osteoprogenitor cells differentiate into osteoblasts right? So you knock out estrogen, you're going to get less osteoblasts as well. So it's a kind of a two hit attack. So right there you can see why um, menopause, why more women get osteoporosis just for the simple thing on estrogen. Um, Alright, so now we're up to um, well, I, I've got testosterone drawn here, so I'll draw it. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but like I mentioned before, um, men tend to have more, they, that men have more testosterone, of course, and testosterone increases bone mass, has an effect. So, men with hyperganism or testosterone problems are at high risk of developing. Um, osteoporosis, so and there would be effects probably on both the osteoblast and the osteoblast, but I'm not going to go into detail for that one. Um, same with sedentary lifestyle and low body weight, especially low body weight. So again, this is largely to do with the peak bone mass thing. Um, I might zoom out here. I'll, I'll run through it. Um, so, essentially, um, forces on bones loading increases osteoblast activity compared to osteoclast activity. 
So you know, similarly, you know, if you lose a tooth and you don't get it put back in, the part of your jaw around that tooth will get smaller, like the bone. Bones require loading and they get stronger with loading. So you know, people who work out a lot will have a, will literally have heavier, stronger bones than people who don't. Um, so if you leave, you know, live a um, live a life that doesn't involve much um, force on your bones, uh, you get add increase of osteoporosis. Um, Alright, here in purple is I've um, I have room a bit, but I think I can do this. I've got calcium, corticosteroids, and low vitamin D. Um, if you mentioned over here, I saw vitamin D decrease increases calcium gut absorption. So all of this and corticosteroids have a similar effect. So low ingested vitamin um, calcium diet. Uh, all means you're going to have low, low calcium, low serum cal calcium. So low serum calcium. Now this is sensed by um, your parathyroid. I think it's been a while since I've done. Yeah. So when you get low serum calcium, um, you're going to get a secretion of parathyroid hormone, PTH, and this is kind of weird, but what it does is it binds the osteoblasts, sorry, OBs, and binds the osteoblasts, and it stimulates them to produce more of this thing called rank L and decreases them to produce less of this thing called OPG. And these are transmitters of some sort. Um, we don't need to go into too much detail there. But what rank L does is it binds to a thing called rank. I'm just going to write binds to rank on osteoblasts. So I'm going to draw a rank L like a little triangle. Uh, we're kind of probably familiar with this stuff and the so yeah, it binds like that on the osteoclast and OPG. And we can just say it looks like this. So it actually would normally stop that. So because of this, you have lots of rank L, right? And this binds the rank on osteoclasts. And what it does is it increases OC activity. And Yeah, so it increases their activity, so I'll, and probably how many there are as well. So, so it's a bit of a complicated way it does that. It does it through the osteoblast, but whatever. Um, what else did I have left? Um, I've got these miscellaneous things. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. Smoking, they probably think, is to do with its effects on the cardiovascular system. Remember, bones, living tissue has lots of blood supply and all that, so anything that stuffs up blood supply in general is probably going to affect bones, the living organ. Um, hyperphy, short for hyperthyroid, so it increases your basic metabolism and for whatever reason it tends to have more of an effect on the osteoclasts. So I might zoom out a bit. Um, so it tends to just have more effect on RC class. Um, the gastro, um, things like that, they probably have an effect on, you know, your gut absorption of calcium and vitamin D. Um, yeah. Heparin, I actually don't know a fan. Um, renal has lots of issues. Um, 
it's involved in the vitamin D thing and because all your waste stuff, you stuff up your kidneys, completely stuffs up all your electro electro all your blood chemistry essentially. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and other inflammatory conditions, they tend to have an effect on the osteoclasts. Um, they kind of get mixed in with the macrophages and that kind of increases it. Um, there was one thing I didn't mention, which I think is really important um, to think about, and that's obesity. Uh, just obesity. Now, um, it's generally considered, and if you read on Wikipedia, you'll find out that obesity has a protective protective effect on osteoporosis. Um, and this is because weight bearing, so you know, if you're, you're big and fat, um, now when I say obesity, I, I mean obesity from fat, not from being a bodybuilder with a massive BMI because you're pumped up, but anyways, they believe that being heavier increases weight bearing must be protective, um, but there's a bit of emerging evidence um, that actually it's not. Um, I don't have my notes in there, but they're not. There's a few theories. Um, one is that there's more inflammation. Um, two, um, fat cells are derived from the same cells that osteoblasts are, so it causes less osteoblasts. Um, and I think there's some other things that have left in them and stuff, but I'm not sure. But anyways, it, it's kind of still a bit new and it's not really accepted 100%, but um, I think there's a bit of a changing trend that no, obesity is not protective. Um, yeah, that's that. Um, for the pathophysiology, the etiology, and I guess the pathophysiology a bit as well. Um, I oh, know, I'll say pathophysiology can start here, osteoporosis, so low bone density. So I made this video a bit on the fly, it's a bit all over the place. Um, but whatever. Um, yeah, I'll draw a smiley face to cheer you up. There you go. Alright, so low bo bone density, so you've got these weak bones. Um, they're not sick in the sense that um, they're formed correctly, the matrix is correct, they just essentially um, aren't as dense, they don't have the same as amount of mineral deposition and all that. So, weak bones, pathophysiology is easy, weak bones, break. Break easily. That's the path of physiology, I reckon. Anyways, so on to signs and symptoms. I'll do in grey. Why not? Um, the classic symptom. Um, is fragility fractures. Uh, what's a fragility fracture? That is when you break something when if you were healthy you wouldn't. So people fall out of bed and break their hip. Or, and that might be from the actual impact or it might just be because their ligaments and muscles are so strong, even though they're probably old and weak, but so strong compared to the bones that just snaps them. Um, so the common fractures are, um, hip's the one that everyone thinks about and it's probably the most important because it um, has the worst outcomes. Um, sorry. When I say hip, I mean neck of femur. Okay. Yep. Um, also, the distal head of the, rainia, of the, of the radius. So that's your weight-bearing wrist bone. Um, towards the hand, 
um, also vertebral vertebrae. Um, and the types are normally wedge, wedge or crush. Um, quick point about these vertebral frush, um, fractures, they are often missed. I'll go, to, I'll go to red, why not? Often miss, so look for them. So look for them. Uh, apparently a lot of radiologists don't. Some studies have said they don't find them enough. And all doctors should be aware. So if you're x-raying somebody who's old or doesn't get much sunlight or has all the, any other risk factors and you're just doing a chest x-ray or whatever, have a look at the vertebrae and see if there's any fractures and learn how to do that. I'm not going to teach you that because I don't have the ability. Um, Alright, um, so that's the classic one. Um, other less common things are height loss, um, so from kyphosis, so it's because of the weak, weak um, vertebral, or scoliosis. Uh, and sometimes people get back pain. So, besides breaking your hip, it's asymptomatic, asymptomatic. so I'll change colours again, um, investigate based on risk factors. Um, yeah, of course, if somebody comes to you with a broken, hip, a broken theme and then investigate that, but if you have somebody who's old and uh, quite skinny and smokes and is dark or dark skinned or doesn't um, get much sunlight or you know doesn't have the best diet, investigate. And you know, probably just if they're old, it's probably reason enough to investigate. Um, on to investigations. Gold standard for diagnosis is the D X A B M D. Um, I don't actually have it written down what DXA stands for. S something X-ray, B and D, bone mineral, mineral density. Um, so that's your, your gold standard for um, diagnosis. So I'm, I kind of want to rush through this video because it's taking way too long. So I'm going to just kind of rush through the re rest. Um, other re so then the routine investigations. So once you diagnose somebody. Um, clinically or or based on the DXA, um, you want to get blood picture, um, you know, so CBP, ESR. You want to do biochem, um, so yeah, your ALP. Look at um, serum calcium, serum phosphate. Um, get some renal tests. So this is what you're doing, everyone. Um, you also want to measure vitamin D. Now, um, you want to do the 250H1. So we'll just scroll up quickly. This one here. So it's not the active form. It's before it's um, converted um, by the kidneys, but that's most stable. I'm running out of room. Um, And uh, you also other things you might do, maybe do if it's clinic if you think it's clinical clinically relevant is um, bone turnover markers. So this is things you won't do on everyone, but um, when you're an experienced consultant, you'll know. Um, you want to look at um, parathyroid hormone sometimes, testosterone. Celiac screen and lots of other stuff. So um, essentially, you want to look for um, secondary causes, I guess. Um, when I say secondary, I mean it's not just from being old or or well, menopause could probably be considered a secondary cause. So you want to investigate that. But all your things like um, maybe it's a gastro issue that you didn't know they had or some renal problems 
that kind of stuff you will want to investigate if you think yeah, um, if you're suspicious um, and be uh, holistic be holistic you know look at um, full risk especially you know when you investigate someone you want to check whether or not they're going to fall so yeah um, all, all, all the things like um, various mental diseases strength flexibility all that stuff unbalance um, gait issues yeah. alright um, so that's it for investigation let's quickly go through management um, I don't have much room which is my bad. Kind of tried to go through this really quickly and informally and without much preparation. Uh, so yeah, I'll zoom in a bit. To do. All right. Um, oh, sorry about the mess. Uh, management. I like to always start with non-pharmacological lifestyle and diet. It usually works for most things pretty well um, and generally has less side effects. That's good. So, um, exercise for prevention, and you know, if they, if they do have it, but they can exercise. So, things are low, low impact. Uh, you want to increase strength, strength, flexibility, balance. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, then, sort of your more um, your more kind of physio kind of special exercises and that kind of stuff. You want to um, you know also do things to help with their gait, that kind of stuff, um, and other falls interventions. Um, so this might be you know uh, giving them a walking stick. Um, yeah, there's so many things you can do that, uh, you know, depending on the surface of walking stick, take peanut rugs, all that kind of stuff, um, occupational therapist kind of things. Um, and you want to get them some decent sun exposure. Why? We know why. Let's find it. That's why. Because um, without sun exposure, you don't have active vitamin D. Vitamin D, you have decreased calcium gut absorption, decreased bone calcification, um, and maybe due to the osteophytes, just your um, whole process doesn't work so well. Um, sun exposure. <sighs> All right. Um, diet as well. Yeah, uh, calcium, etc. Calcium is mainly maybe vitamin D in your diet, but um, clinically, vitamin D in the diet is not so important. Um, yeah, unless you're actually getting uh, pharmacological stuff. So let's move on to the, the um, drugs. Um, first one, vitamin D. D3 actually, so that's this one here. Yep, given that, and then it doesn't matter about sun exposure. Um, and that's helpful. Um, calcium supplements. Yep, I'll change color, I don't like this color. Um, the more heavier stuff. Probably the most well known thing is the biphosphonate. Biphosphonate. That's not right. Biphosphonate. P in there. Biphosphonate. Yeah, 
so I kind of learnt his stuff properly today. <laughs> um, about an hour ago, so go with me. Um, Biosphore snakes are pretty cool. Um, they get in the bone. Absorbed by osteoclasts. Dot dot dot. Osteoclasts die. So, anyways, you remember osteoclasts are the ones that eat, so that will decrease the osteoclast amount in their activity. So, it's quite an effective drug. Um, first line treatment in postmenopausal women with, with it, um, but I'm not going to go into the indications too much more, just about how they, wo how they work. Um, look at your country's guidelines or whatever. Um, other thing, hormone therapy for women post-menopause. So that's pretty easy. How does that work? We know already because we've done the pathophysiology. By giving them estrogen, you're going to increase growth factors, which is going to increase the differentiate of osteoblasts from osteoprogenital cells and you're also going to um, so, uh, right here, decrease estrogen so estrogen also um, has a direct effect on osteoclasts and estrogen causes them to die more often Apo apoptosis so hormone therapy give estrogen works pretty well um, however, uh, you know, they've had the big meta-analysis where women on, on hormone therapy tend to have more cardiovascular risks. Uh, there's the controversy that might also lead to an increased risk of breast cancer. So, um, you know, you give for other reasons. So if they're having a lot of symptoms, as like um, symptoms of menopause and they want the treatment, and falls is a major risk, definitely probably go for the hormone therapy. If you're more concerned about the cardiovascular stuff, then probably not go for it. Um, but it's complicated. Um, the next thing on my list is, it's always labelled as parathyroid hormone. Um, which, when I was re researching this, I found it really, really confusing. That you give parathyroid parathyroid hormone for osteoporosis because parathyroid hormone secreted when you have low serum calcium causes osteoblasts to make rank L and OPG and less OPG which in the rank L activates osteoclasts and increases their activity so there's more bone absorption Whew. so why would you give it so I find out that the parathyroid hormone that they give called um, I think the main one is Terry Parathyroid is incomplete. So it's not the whole thing, it's synthetic, it's 38 out of 86 of, of the hormone or something. But anyways, and what that does in intermittent, that's spelled wrong, whatever, exposure, it increases osteoblast activity so remember osteoclasts do not have a receptor but for it but um, osteoblasts do so it stimulates them um, normally it stimulates them to secrete the things that make your osteoclastic m more active but in this scenario just I guess um, just stimulates the osteoblasts themselves so cool um, there is raloxifen. I'm almost done with these. It's been a long thing, actually full length lecture. Raloxifen. Um, that's a selective androgen receptor modulator. Um, big word full. Sounds like it has a complicated method of action, um, action, which it does, not fully understood. But effectively, it's an estrogen and an estrogen agonist, so um, especially for bones and, and um, 
maybe I, I can't remember. But for bones, anyways, it, it acts as an estrogen agonist. So if you remember our estrogen stuff from before. Um, another one is strontium. 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 Sorry, that's wrong. Strontium. Can late. Um, I only just heard of it recently. Um, I can't actually remember how it works, works but it increases like, osteoblasts and it also increases, it makes them secrete more OPG. OPG, remember, binds to rank L, so it stops it from binding to rank, which means that you're not getting the osteoblasts, osteoclasts. Um, stimulation. Um, that's it for the pharmacological treatment. So that's probably enough. We'll do outcomes real quick. I'll even write it in full outcomes. I'm going to do, I'll do it in black but I'm using a black background so I'm going to do it in red. I'm going to do it in red because outcomes are bad. Or bad than what you think. Surprisingly bad. Um, yeah, not so bad if you don't have any fractures, but um, one in six women in their life get a serious fracture. Um, so, serious fracture, e.g., your um, if you get your, like your hip fracture, um, which is the, the neck of the femur, um, that that carries with it a two to three increase times mortality and that's at one 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 year so one year later compared to you know someone similar who didn't get a fracture it's, it's huge um, you know, we tend to kind of oh, well, I tend to think of broken bones you know whatever um, broken bones heal but um, no when you when you're old and you get a hip which is you know fame is such a big thing it, really stuffs you up. Anyways, uh, and it's a major cause of morbidity. In the fact that after the hip, uh, after a major fracture, 15 to 25 percent of the patients enter long-term care. Um, yep, so that's it. Just going to zoom out and look at the mess and kind of quickly go over it. Um, Sorry, this probably looks pretty messy. Um, we looked at the definition, we looked at the risk factors. Um, age is the biggest one for a variety of reasons. Things that contribute to low vitamin D, stuff you up. Um, oh, this has gone too long, I'm not going to bother going through it. Um, yeah, cheers. <laughs>